It was an unseasonably warm February day in 2017 in the small rural town of Delphi, Indiana. It's not a place where you worry when your teenage kids decide to go on an adventure. So when Abby Williams and her best friend Libby German decided to go on a hike near the Monin High Bridge in the middle of the day, no one thought it was dangerous. But when Libby and Abby did not show up when they were supposed to get picked up, their families began to worry and they began to search. Then the next day, the worst news possible. The bodies of these two girls were found, both victims of murder. As the investigation progressed over five years, there were sketches of the suspect that looked like two different people. And there was video of the killer. Then, finally, an arrest of the accused murderer, Richard Allen. Now, Allen says he didn't do it, and he also alleges it was a group of Odinites who were actually responsible, white nationalists practicing an ancient Nordic religion. Today, a major development in the case as court TV cameras rolled inside the courtroom, Richard Allen was there, but without his attorneys. Tonight, we are live from the courthouse with this major shakeup in the case as we continue our investigation of the Delphi murders. I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. Let's start here. Abby and Libby, they were two great kids. Two great kids who were doing what kids do, right? You're good friends. You've got a day off from school. It's a little warmer than it's supposed to be. Hey, let's go for a hike. Let's go for a hike. Isn't that what we want our kids to do these days? Put your phones down. Go outside, get some fresh air, for goodness sake. And that's what they did. That's what they, and you should be able to do that. Children should be able to go outside and go for a walk. And you shouldn't have to worry about it. But now we all do. They're in Delphi, Indiana. I mean, this is a very small town. This is a safe small town. How, how, why would this happen there? Why would you even think for a second even for a second, that there'd be trouble there. You know, it's a nice day. There's probably, uh, you know, some people out. We know that there were other witnesses who were there, so they weren't the only ones there. Obviously, the killer was there as well, but there were other people who were out and about that day. And this crime scene, so very disturbing. What happened to these girls? and what they went through, and then what the final scene looked like. Now that crime scene will be significant in this case, we think, based upon what we've seen alleged by Richard Allen through his attorneys, that this was, from their perspective, some ritualistic killing, and obviously for prosecutors, it's a double murder. It's not a ritual, it has nothing to do with a cult or religion or anything like that. But what the scene looked like and how these two children uh, appeared where they were murdered is some of the most important evidence in this case. There's photos of that crime scene as there are any crime scene, right? The investigators gets there, they get there, they look for the evidence, they mark spots, they photograph everything. Sometimes they'll video record everything as well to preserve it um, for when and if they find out who's responsible and have to try the case inside of a courtroom. And you try to figure things out. You're examining the evidence, you're collecting the evidence while you're there, but you're also memorializing what the scene was like when investigators first arrived. So it's important evidence, but like I said, it's a very disturbing crime scene. So in this case, there's a gag order, no one's talking, but also evidence, and a lot of the um, motions and papers that have been filed are all under seal for various reasons. One, the judge is attempting to preserve um, any, uh, and anyone being exposed to the evidence beforehand because they're all prospective jurors, and we see that in a lot of cases. 
in different jurisdictions. Some jurisdictions you see and hear everything before the trial. But also to protect these girls and their families. So the crime scene pictures were sealed. Obviously, the attorneys have access to it, but that was it. The, the attorneys and, and their experts. Those pictures were leaked. And we, we've covered that on this show. We spoke to uh, some podcasters from Murder Sheet, who will be back on tonight, who unsolicited received copies of these pictures. They deleted them. Um, but that was a, 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 a violation of the court's order and something that I think really struck a nerve with folks in this small town in Indiana um, and the judge and everyone else associated with this story. It, it struck a nerve. So there was a hearing that was called today. And for the first time in my history at Court TV, our cameras inside a courtroom in Indiana. Let's take a look. We are on the record in the state of Indiana versus Richard Allen, 08 C01 2210 MR1. Thank you for your patience, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. McClellan, Mr. Luttrell, for your patience. Um, we've had an unexpected turn of events, ladies and gentlemen. Um, earlier this afternoon, the defense attorneys have withdrawn their representation of Mr. Allen. Mr. Baldwin made an oral motion to withdraw. I granted that oral motion to withdraw and Mr. Rosie will be submitting a written motion to withdraw, I'm assuming within the next couple of days. Um, they have confirmed with the court that Mr. Allen's uh, financial situation remains static, meaning he is continuing to be entitled to appointed counsel. I will reach out to public defenders to make that appointment. Um, as Mr. Allen is now without counsel, I've ordered him transported back to the Department of Correction. Mr. McClellan, I know that we have already scheduled a hearing in the Carroll Circuit Court October 31st at 9 a.m. I'd like to maintain that hearing if we can, please. Yes, Your um, I think at that point um, we can have counsel appointed. Um, I'd like to set a new trial date. Obviously, I don't believe counsel will be prepared within the next couple of months to try a case of this magnitude in January. Um, so we'll set dates for the trial. I think we need to set a date as well for the suppression hearing that was filed now by former counsel. Um, I have asked the attorneys um, to provide all of the discovery previously provided to back to the state of Indiana. I know I entered a protective order on the discovery and honestly I don't remember when that was. I think it was in April of this year perhaps, maybe sooner. But the attorneys have been ordered to provide all of that discovery back to the state. And if you would maintain that until such time as it can be turned over to successor counsel, I would appreciate that, Mr. McClellan. Yes, um, I've also asked the defense attorneys to um, cooperate with successor counsel. They're not required to do that, but I think that they will in the best interests of um, Mr. Allen. They're not required to provide any of their work product, um, but they will be required and have indicated that they will cooperate with successor counsel. So obviously without counsel, Mr. Allen's hearing cannot proceed. I apologize that I know many of you have been waiting for several hours. I know Mr. McClellan, you and your staff, and you had some witnesses here. Um, that came earlier to have the hearing, but clearly this is outside of our control. So is there anything, Mr. McClellan, that you'd like to state for the record? No, Your Honor, I think we can address the other issues at the October 31st court date. All right. With that being said, then, we are in recess. Thank you. I'll see you in October. All right. Wow. Wow. This trial was scheduled for January. It was ramping up. We were getting ready to go. Um, and the families who've been waiting so long for justice were getting ready to go. And I'm sure uh, Richard Allen, who believes and says he's innocent, uh, was getting ready to go. It's not going to happen. It's going to happen. Let's, let's go straight out to Court TV crime and justice correspondent Matt Johnson joining us live from the courthouse, the beautiful courthouse, beautiful courtroom in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Uh, Matt, uh, great to see you tonight. 
Let me ask you the question that's on everyone's mind tonight. This withdrawal of the defense team, did it have anything to do, anything, with the leaked crime scene photos? Hey, Vinny, always great to see you. And you know what? That is what's on everybody's mind. Here at the Allen County Courthouse behind me, they didn't say as much today. The judge didn't. Everybody else is under gag order, right? But you can kind of connect the dots here because this comes on the heels of those leaked crime scene photos. And then this unplanned hearing was scheduled. All parties required to be here within days. And then this happened today. But before the defense for Richard Allen um, recused himself or withdrew, defense attorney Andrew Baldwin hired an attorney himself who filed a motion talking about possible disqualification or sanctions, talking about what happened in his office, right? They write this, quote, Attorney Baldwin did nothing wrong. He was snookered and abused. This issue before the court is a horrible tragedy created by persons not related to the defense of Mr. Allen. There were three disseminators, one of which committed suicide after a law enforcement investigation began. Goes on to say this, Mr. Baldwin trusted a friend to respect his office space. He was betrayed. Since that transgression, Mr. Baldwin has kept all Delphi-related items locked in a room or a locked fireproof file, file cabinet. Now, this motion was filed, filed, uh, you would think, to argue that he wanted to stay on the case, that he remedied the problem. This all taking place, we think, earlier today, which could have been the reason why this hearing was delayed in the first place, because that was set to happen at 2 o'clock. We had the prosecutors there. We had potential witnesses. We had family drive up from Delphi. Everybody was in place, but there was this huge delay, and we never actually did see the defense attorneys or Mr. Allen there in court today. So that's probably what was being discussed, their resignation, before the judge walked in. And, and I mean, from what we've seen from these defense attorneys, they were all in on this defense. I mean, they were passionate, and, and it seems that they truly believe that Richard Allen is 100% innocent in all of this, and we're fully invested in, in trying this case. Absolutely. Um, they were all in. Remember, they were under gag order right away, but they were fighting vigorously to defend their client that they said early on was innocent of all of these charges. And then it was that flurry of motions of any that you've gone in depth in, um, allegations of Odinism, that this is a cover up, that there were other people involved, that it wasn't investigated properly. And then they were calling for the Franks hearing because they were saying his rights were violated, that um, the law enforcement lied to get the search warrant into the home, so that means the gun and everything else that was confiscated should be thrown out of evidence. I mean, they really fought hard for their client. Okay, so our camera's in the courtroom in Indiana for the first time, and I think that's a great move. And this is a great example of why. Because in a case like this where there's allegations of conspiracies and defense attorneys disappear, if you don't have cameras in the courtroom to show the world why this is happening and what's on the record, then people are going to wonder what's really going on. Um, with that said, uh, who was at, at, in, in court today? Well, you know, we lined up for hours. So you had podcasters and YouTubers and you had um, journalists from all across the country and all across Indiana here and waiting for several hours to get one of the 90 or so spots in the gallery today. And the first couple rows was was only for family members. So you had Libby and Abby's family members, you know, represented there. Um, they go to every hearing. They wanted to see what today was going to be about, what was going to be discussed, what could come of, you know, the discussion of those possible leaked photos. Um, but they couldn't talk after this big bombshell today because, again, they remain under gag order. They left very disappointed. But we were able to talk to a couple trial watchers, as I call them. And here's what one woman had to say. Take a listen. Very disappointed. However, um, just talking to some other attorneys and people local that have been following it very closely as well, um, it doesn't seem to be much of a surprise that they've recused themselves essentially from it. So um, very disappointed from my standpoint. However, it doesn't seem like it's that shocking to most at this point. 
And Vinny, there's been a lot of questions about um, how Allen is looking. What was he going to look like in court? This would have been our first time, obviously, to see him in any of the proceedings. Remember, his first court appearance was kept secret. It was one year ago on Halloween when there was that big news conference when they said, if you're looking for answers, today is not that day. We didn't learn a whole lot then. And today we were going to try to see if he was going to be dressed in street clothing, if he was going to be dressed in the coveralls from the jail, from the prison. We were going to see his appearance. Remember, he lost a lot of weight. His attorneys were also fighting um, throughout the year to try to get him removed out of the prison. Um, so we were going to look to see what he looked like, but he was never even brought into the courtroom. You know who we did see was his wife. She left the hallway from behind where the judge walks in and the doorway that he would have been brought in. She came across where the jury box is and she was full of tears. She sat down for a moment, then she was escorted out. And then after that, there was that announcement by the judge that he no longer had representation. It's, it's, it's really shocking. I mean, I don't know what his relationship was like with his attorneys, but my guess is uh, I think he probably really liked those attorneys because of how hard they were uh, fighting for him. And I'm wondering what he's thinking tonight about all of this. So let's, let's take a look at what's next now. Like we had a trial scheduled for January 8th, right after the new year, first big trial of 2024. Uh, do we know what's next now and what's going to happen, how all this is going to play out? We don't, but what we do know, that trial date, you can just forget it. That is not going to happen, and the judge said as much today. She said, I don't think that whoever is assigned to this case, to this defense, is going to get up to, to speed with all of the discovery that they're going to have to read into and do their own defense work. So she says that um, they are still planning on having that hearing on Halloween on October 31st, and that'll be in Carroll County, where most of the proceedings have been. Remember, the judge has been assigned to the case after the other judge recused themselves, and she makes the trip down there. But this was an emergency hearing of sorts, so it was held in her own jurisdiction here at this courthouse in Allen County. So there will be that hearing. and. That still could be the suppression hearing, which we think could be the Franks hearing, where whoever the defense counsel is could choose to still challenge the search warrant in all of this, Vinny. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how they handle that, you know, because you got new attorneys coming in. They may see things a little differently. They may pick up on things that the other side didn't pick up on, or they may disagree with some legal arguments that have been made, but, but we'll see how it all plays out. Wow. Big, big news tonight. Matt Johnson there delivering it all. Uh, we'll check back in with you in a little bit. Uh, let's bring in our guests. Uh, joining us tonight, Indianapolis, Indiana, hosts of the Murder Sheet podcast, Anya Kane and Kevin Greenlee. Also with us in Los Angeles, California, senior reporter for DailyMail.com, host of Daily Mail Crime on TikTok and victim advocate for Project Cold Case, Caitlin Becker. And finally, in Chicago, Illinois, criminal defense attorney, host of the Defense Diaries, who was also in court today, Bob Mata, as was uh, Anya and Kevin as well. All right, uh, uh, Kevin and Anya, I'll begin with you. We had you on the show. You tracked how all this happened. You said it looks like it came from the defense. It seems like the defense uh, conceded that in the papers that they filed. Um, you also said, Kevin, I remember very specifically, they could get disqualified for this. And I was like, I was shocked, but you were right. Um, your thoughts and Anya's thoughts about what happened today. Well, I think ultimately I wasn't surprised that at the end of the day, these attorneys were off this case considering the gravity of what occurred. But what did surprise me, even shock me, was that they chose to go on their own. Earlier that morning, uh, Andy Baldwin, one of the attorneys in this case, actually hired a criminal defense attorney to represent himself and to fight to stay on this case. So it's unclear to me what made him change his mind and just walk away. Caitlin Becker, this case has taken so long to get to where we are now. And now for the families of the victims, they're going to have to wait longer. Richard Allen says he didn't do it. He's going to have to wait longer. Um, th this is a really an unexpected uh, twist and turn uh, at this junction of this case that goes back to 2017. 
Um, your thoughts tonight? You know, Vinny, I have to wonder what the ultimate purpose was for leaking the images. I just don't know what the goal was because it doesn't seem that it has helped anybody, any party at all, particularly not the defense. And if these images were leaked from the defense team, as you said, they said in court, and as of course you guys said, because you two got the images originally, to what end? I mean, if you're working for the defense, this seems to sort of hamstring them from properly defending their client. And now we have this major setback. I'm just so curious as to where they thought this was going to go and why they thought to do it. I mean, people leak stuff to us all of the time. They leak images that they shouldn't leak. They leak documents that they shouldn't leak. But there's usually a purpose to it. It's to get out information that wasn't previously out there. It is to sort of hold feet to the fire that, you know, aren't being held to the fire in a place of authority. But I just don't see the reason that this was done. Uh, I just want to go back to Anya on that. Anya, any indication from your investigation as to why the person who grabbed those images and disseminated them, why they did it? Were they selling them? Was there some, like, do we know? Yeah, it's such a good question. And it's it's unfortunate because in this situation, we don't really have an answer about an ultimate motive. We can say in the communication that we saw between people who are not the original leaker, but who kind of got it down the line is, um, there seems to be some sort of sense that, you know, um, it's kind of a combination of morbid curiosity, but also like we need to put out this because, uh, you know, it could prove the defense's theory is more credible with the Odinism and, you know, here's how the crime scene looked. So um, I don't think that this was coming from the defense attorneys. We've seen no evidence of that whatsoever. But I think it, it was a situation where you had people um, just put stuff out there that they shouldn't have. And then it just spirals out of control because we, as we all know, one person leaks to one person and then that person leaks to two. And, and unfortunately we've seen that where this is just kind of spread like a wildfire across the internet. And we're just dreading that these images, some of the graphic images might come out and be published. And we're, we're just really praying that that does not happen. Bob Mata, let me ask you about, let's start with Richard Allen, right? Every defendant has the right to their counsel of choice. Now, this is appointed counsel in this case, but my guess is with them filing all this stuff, being very aggressive, very um, committed to the case, that maybe they are the attorneys that he wanted, but they want it out, but they don't get out unless the judge lets them out. How does all this affect uh, the defendant and the defendant's rights? It's it's huge, and, and actually, Kevin and Anya, uh, we were talking about that before uh, when we were kind of pontificating what we thought might happen in there. And what stunned me, not, as, not so much that Baldwin ended up uh, withdrawing, because I think he was under a lot of heat. When we walked into that courtroom at about 1 o'clock and it was empty, and then I, I don't know if it was about 1.50 and about eight law enforcement officers from Doug Carter to Tony Leggett walked in there and they all sat in the jury box. At that point, you knew one of two things was going on. Either the judge was going to try to have some kind of hearing to make a preliminary finding for a Frank's hearing or that she was going to proceed in terms of a removal hearing. So they were back in chambers for two hours and, and, and we all saw Baldwin come in and you know he was back there Rosie was back there, McLeanland was back there, and, and they really had this out back in chambers for hours. We waited for an extra half an hour before it was supposed to start. In the meantime, I'm sitting directly behind Richard Allen's wife and mother who are weeping. You know, so they knew something was going on and then and people kept coming to talk to them. And like, Kathy was just crying the entire time. That's Richard Allen's wife. From the minute she got into that courtroom and from the minute that, that Rosie pulled her out five minutes before the judge came in, as far as Richard's uh, Sixth Amendment right, it's devastating. You know, because yeah, these guys were appointed, but they're private counsel. And you could tell by the, the depth of which, agree with it or not, but those memos that they put out, there was a ton of work that was put into those. That is not your typical public defender type filing just because of lack of time, because they have a huge amount of cases to work on. These guys were fighting to the death for this guy. 
So I have every feeling that Richard Allen is sitting there devastated as, as well as his family. All right. We'll continue to follow this part of the story. But when we come back, we're going to literally walk you through um, what happened to Abby and Libby. Plus, coming up next hour. In Delphi, Indiana, Abby and Libby German were brutally murdered in 2017, five years after the murders. Richard Allen was arrested and charged. He says he is innocent and is pointing the finger at local Odinists. Tonight, we are live from Indiana with news of a major development in the case. Mr. Allen's uh, financial situation remains static, meaning he is to be entitled to appointed counsel. I will reach out to public defenders to make that appointment. Um, as Mr. Allen is now without counsel, I've ordered him transported back to the Department of Correction. There's a tragic outcome in this case. Civil trial that is the focus of the Netflix documentary, Take Care of Maya. How a misdiagnosis tore their family apart. They continue to accuse Jack and Beata of being child abusers. Jack called me and said Beata just hung herself. Is the hospital they're suing responsible for what happened? The Take Care of Maya trial. Trial coverage weekday mornings at 8, 7 central on Court TV. So we're at about the halfway point of the Monon High Bridge here behind me in Delphi, Indiana. You can see I'm standing on a part that is rebuilt, looks completely different than the area that leads over to private property. About this area right here, that's where that Snapchat photo was taken, where Libby takes a picture of her friend Abby. The two girls, they were heading down the bridge south over to private property, and that's where the abduction happened. Okay, let's pick it up from there and we'll show you and walk you through um, what happened that day where Abby and Libby were. Well, first, let's show you where Abby and Libby were dropped off. It's February 13th, 2017, around 149, dropped off across from the Mears Farm, which is located on the north side of County Road 300. This is an important road. County Road 300 uh, north near the entrance of the trails. At 2.13, video from Libby's cell phone shows the girls encountered a man on the southeast portion of the Monin High Bridge, which you just saw that Matt showed you. The video shows the girls walking southeast on the bridge, then the male orders the girls down the hill. Okay, February 14th, 2017, the girls' bodies are discovered. There is clothing found in Deer Creek south of where the bodies were were located. So there you have a look at where this all is. And, and in part of what happens is they end up on one side of the creek and then their bodies end up back on the original side of the creek where they were. Let's bring back in our guests tonight, Anya Kane, Kevin Greenlee, Caitlin Becker, Bob Mata. Hi, right, Anya and, and Kevin. To me, looking at the, the, what happened here, they had to cross that creek, didn't they, once they are abducted or under the control of the killer, they cross over the bridge, which takes you over the creek to one side, but then their bodies are found back over on the other side of the creek. Yes, uh, Vinny, that is our understanding as well, that they would have had to you know, traverse this creek. Um, we went there a number of years ago. We were too scared to actually go up on top of the bridge, but we went underneath. Um, it was a pretty shallow creek in portions, but then again, it also seems to kind of be something that maybe gets deeper at different times of year. So we'd be very curious in learning more about how exactly it looked that day. And, you know, would there be any places to traverse it easily? And also, what does that tell us about this incident? Were the girls running? Um, were they trying to escape? Or was this part of the killer's plan? Now, let's take a, a look. This is from the probable cause affidavit. Investigators spoke with a witness who stated that she was traveling east on 300 North. I told you it's an important part of all of this. So the witness is driving east uh, towards the right there on February 13th um, and observed a male subject walking west on the north side of 300 North away from the Monin High Bridge. Uh, the witness advised that the male subject was wearing a blue-colored jacket and blue jeans and was muddy and bloody. 
She further stated that it appeared he had gotten into a fight. Investigators will, were able to determine from watching video from the Hoosier Harv Harvest Store that the witness was traveling on a CR 300 North at approximately 3.57 p.m. Caitlin Becker, this is how they're putting together their timeline and their allegation is, is that he comes back up and is walking down 300 North going back to where he had parked his car east of that Hoosier Harvester store. That's exactly right, Vinny. And from what we understand from witnesses, the car was parked sometime in the between 1 to 2 p.m. hours, so quite a bit earlier than Abby and Libby had been dropped off at the park and gone on their hike. The timing seems very tight to me. The last communication that they have is that Snapchat video that's about 2.13 p.m. We hear the down the hill moment. So from 2.13 to about 3.37, which is their timeline there, that's when we have to understand that the abduction murder, and it seemed like movement happened. So were they, the question is, were they killed and then moved or taken away from that area and then murdered? But either way, if Richard Allen is the person we're talking about, and of course, presumed innocent until guilty, he, no matter what, would have had to come back that other direction in order to get to his car. So to even think to do that covered in mud and blood and not think that anybody would see you always felt a little bit odd, but the timeline seems pretty tight for two murders and the bodies found significantly further away from where the abduction took place. Uh, Bob Mata, what are your thoughts about the timeline that prosecutors have put together and laid out here in this case? Well, th therein lies the rub with what happened today, right? Because we had two attorneys that were challenging that, and they had a Frank's motion that they were asking for a hearing, wherein they're saying that Tony Liggett, who was the, the affiant, the person who drafted that affidavit for the you know probable cause affidavit, that he was lying. You know, and, and flat out, the, the defense was saying that in terms of the, the bloody and muddy clothes, that they weren't bloody. You know, so it, it's like, the, we don't know at this point, like, where it's going to go from here in terms of who successor counsel is, is, is part of the puzzle now, because there's allegations out there that we can't pretend that they don't exist anymore, merely because Baldwin and Rosie are no longer a part of the mix. I mean, the question will become, will new counsel adopt what they've filed i mean they, they have no obligation to if they come in like you said earlier Vinny. if they're like I, like i'm not i'm not going by this this is crazy you know i mean if they have a different interpretation of the evidence they may want to go a completely different route but i mean we have to get to that juncture at this point to me the timeline is still in the air it's fluid until we have some more hearings because at this point all we have is the state's theory of the case and we, we kind of have the defense's theory of the case, or at least his former defense attorney's, you know, theory of the case. So we've got to kind of wait and see to see how it plays out. All right, everybody stay where you are. When we come back, another part of this case that has always puzzled me and I think is another potential problem for prosecutors, the sketches, the sketches of the suspect. And do they look like the man on the bridge? Do they look like Richard Allen? We'll talk about that next. Detectives and investigators have recovered what's believed to be human remains. Chad Daybell's residence. You have two children who have vanished, and their mother doesn't seem to care about where her missing children are. If somebody two years ago said, this is what's going to happen with Lauren. I mourn with all of you who mourn. I would have never believed it. Victim to Verdict with Ted Rollins. All new Sunday night, 8, 7 central, only on Court TV. Detectives and investigators have recovered what's believed to be human remains. Chad Daybell's residence. You have two children who have vanished, and their mother doesn't seem to care about where her missing children are. If somebody two years ago said, this is what's going to happen with Lauren. I mourn with all of you who mourn. I would have never believed it. Victim to Verdict with Ted Rollins. All new Sunday night, 8, 7 central, only on Court TV. Guys. 
That's your killer. There he is. Okay, so they have video of him, but as you can see, it's not the clearest. You really don't pick up necessarily in detail the features of the face, which are so significant in identifying someone. This case, there are eyewitnesses, eyewitnesses who provided descriptions, which then turned into uh, police sketches. Let's take a look at them. There's two of them. Sketch one and sketch two. Sketch one is on the left, sketch two is on the right. That's how they refer to them. However, you should know this, that sketch one on the left was drawn after sketch two on the right. So sketch two on the right was actually drawn in February of 2017. The witness description of a man on the Monon High Bridge, about 20 years old, brown curly hair, medium build, age 20, kind of boyish features. I mean, I've been saying this is the Justin Timberlake sketch, right? Now, let me tell you the story of sketch one, which actually was drawn after sketch uh, two. The Unified Command, which has nothing to do with a cult, these are the, the, the name they gave to the investigative unit, uh, did not release the witness sketch to the public for over two years. Instead, they first released another witness sketch called sketch one. The other sketch was illustrated by the FBI sketch artist Plants from Detroit on June 19, 2017 and released to the public on July 17, 2017. Roughly two years later, in March 2019, the witness met with Tony Liggett, frustrated that her sketch, sketch number two, had not been released to the public. The witness was frustrated because sketch one, which had been released to the public almost two years before, did not match the man she observed on the high bridge. The witness even commented that sketch one was wrong. This is from the defense memo. All right, let's bring back in our guests, Anya Kane, Kevin Greenlee, uh, Caitlin Becker, Bob Mata. This drives me crazy because I'm a former prosecutor. I don't like this. This is like they were trying to draw reasonable doubt. Uh, it's, it's, it doesn't make sense. Anya and Kevin, can you make any sense of this? Is it, is it possible that someone else from that sketch two, which was drawn first, was on the bridge, but has nothing to do with the murders? I find that coincidence a bit hard to believe, although I guess if there's evidence pointing to that, then sure. Um, I hate sketches. It's a artistic rendering of somebody's flawed memory. So uh, we are with you on sketches in general. I think if you don't immediately arrest someone based on a sketch, then they're just floating out there for years. In this case, we have two of them and it, cre it creates confusion amongst the public. Everyone's trying to compare things to, in what is, in my view, a very flawed investigative tool. So I don't know, I just think it's a mess. Um, and I think having two of them is a problem, but I think ultimately you're probably gonna hear more about the sketches from the defense than the prosecution, which is gonna lean on the evidence that they do have. Yeah, Caitlin Becker, when we lined them all up there, right there, okay. I could see the sketch all the way to the left, sketch number one, looks kind of like Richard Allen. I could see that. And I can sort of see it with the video still frame. One of these is not like the others. And, and to me, that's a problem, Caitlin. And that's the one that the witness says, oh yeah, that's him. That's definitely him. One of these is definitely not like the others, but I am with you all with the idea of an artist rendering of an eyewitness. Eyewitness recollections are sort of scientifically and notoriously problematic because we don't remember things as clearly as we think we do. But we have that video. We just looked at it. Sketch by the FBI, the one with the hat. I don't remember sketch one, sketch two. I think that was sketch one. The one with the hat looks like bridge guy and bridge guy looks like Richard Allen, particularly subtracting several years from his age to sketch one. I can definitely see that. But the issue that I have isn't necessarily was the, were the sketches artistically rendered differently and that is to account from that. 20 years old and curly hair are yeah. two completely different points. The guy on the bridge is wearing a hat so how you could tell the curly hair and that guy's clearly much older so that to me is the issue but the prosecution said from the beginning yep. that they think more people are involved all right bob we're out of time just give me a number zero to ten how big of a problem is this for the prosecution ten being really bad uh three only a three okay it, thank you i don't i, I don't think we it's don't have time deal. bob we don't have time. I'm out of time. I'm so sorry. But make sure you listen to Defense Diaries, Murder Sheet Podcast, and, of course, DailyMail.com. Thank you all so much.